because your bill may wind up like that, really, really big to repair stuff. Okay, so September 1 is the 160th anniversary of the famous or infamous Carrington event, named after Sir Richard Carrington, a rich English brewer who uh, was rich enough that he could indulge in his hobby of amateur astronomy. This is his house in, at Red Hill in Surrey, outside London. Uh, and on September 1, he observed a white light flare. This thing popped off. It was brilliant white against the background of the sun. Now, he's not looking directly at the sun through the eyepiece. That's what we always tell the kids uh, uh, in astronomy camp is do not look at the sun uh, with your remaining eye. <laughs> it's a mistake you only make once. Uh, so he's got a projector on a sheet of paper, and this thing is brilliant white on white. Uh, around the sunspot region, uh, what we now properly call an active region because there's more involved than sunspots. Uh, Dave Hathaway, uh, former chief of solar physics at Marshall Space Flight Center, says there's an equivalent of about 10 million A-bombs going off in the space of an hour or two. And really for about a second or so, I was hiding behind that, for a second or so, uh, a single event like this, uh, in Carrington event is sort of the benchmark uh, uh, that we need. An event like this, uh, uh, can release as much energy as the total irradiance of the sun. Uh, so it heated up the surface of the sun to light it up. Carrington sees this. He rushes into the house to get the cook, the butler, the gardener, anybody to come out and take a look and confirm the observation. He was a very careful, methodical uh, astronomer. Uh, he gets back, shows over. <laughs> Things dampened out. So he records it in his notebook, but he doesn't report it until a few days later he finds out that there was another astronomer, I believe on the other side of London, who saw it at the same time. So now he's got confirmation. So the simultaneous discovery, I believe it was, was Hodgson, was that the other gentleman's name? Jim? Uh, and, I and don't yeah, right, so, but he gets Carrington's name. And soon afterwards, the fun begins. Uh, this is actually the next day, the magnetographs at Greenwich Observatory outside London literally go off scale. Needles are bouncing back and forth because Earth's magnetic field is getting twisted around. Uh, this painting was made uh, six years later, but it's believed that Church based it on the inspiration of description that a friend gave him of what he observed when he was down uh, in the Antarctic Ocean. Uh, and if you can't read it in the back, Eastern Sky, uh, this is a report from the, the Charleston, South Carolina Mercury because uh, auroras got pushed really far south. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, blood red color, uh, brightest exactly in the east as though the full moon, or rather the sun, were about to rise. Extended almost to zenith, directly overhead. Whole island was illuminated. The sea reflected the phenomenon, and no one could look at it without thinking of the biblical passage, the sea was turned to blood. And the shells resembled coals of fire. So this is one of the things that's been reconstructed uh, by uh, Jim Green, James Green, who used to be in charge of uh, the space physics branch at Marshall and uh, uh, more recently was uh, in charge of so, uh, uh, Space Exploration Division in NASA headquarters. And what they did was they went back through records, newspapers, very methodical. It wasn't just uh, uh, where somebody said, oh, I saw the aurora. Uh, they needed to have it pegged to particular times. Uh, uh, you know, observing it after sunset, you can, you can figure out when that was, given the latitude, the date, et cetera. Uh, uh, various observations, some seemingly not so skilled, but as long as they had it pegged to a time and knew, knew the location, he could establish the sighting. And what we think happened was that the Carrington event was actually a double coronal mass ejection. And we'll get, get to describe what that is in a moment. But it was actually two solar storms within two days of each other. One was relatively slow. That went off on August 28-29 and caused a modest number of auroral sightings. And places, by the way, that don't have sightings doesn't mean that the aurora wasn't there. Cloud cover. There are a lot of places where you, you wouldn't have been able to see it. It could have been the most magnificent show in the world, and you would not have been able to see it, or uh, uh, various other reasons. Uh, my family and I just barely missed seeing the aurora, a really active one, in uh, May 1961, or 1960, rather. Uh, we were up in, uh, uh, staying in Arlington, and NASA was going to launch a sounding rocket out of Wallops Island, do a chemical release upper atmosphere, newspaper story, it's going to be a great light show, et cetera. So everybody's looking to the south, and behind us <laughs> is this great auroral display. We missed it completely. Uh, so there can be various reasons for not seeing stuff. Uh, so what we think is that we wound up 
this is space of about uh, uh, six hours covered here uh, across the world. And you see how, how it becomes more active. And look how far south. Southern California, up in Colorado, Wyoming area, all the way down to the Gulf Coast, all the way down to Havana. You know, the aurora just doesn't get that far. Uh, this is roughly the geomagnetic equator uh, where, where it is on average. Uh, and then two days later, the day after Carrington observe, observes the solar flare, we get hit and it's a really strong event here. So we think there was a relatively slow one and just about the time, uh, uh, just as it's part way towards Earth, a more powerful one blasts off, it comes out faster. And these things are moving sometimes in the order of 2,000 miles per, uh, per second. They get upwards to about 1% the speed of light. That's how energetic the particle blast can be. The radiation blast, of course, uh, the, the visible light, the ultraviolet, the x-rays, et cetera, they hit the atmosphere, they ionize the ionosphere. Just that blast alone, that high energy glow, can mess up radar and radio communications and GPS. But we think in this case there was two, relatively slow one, and a faster one comes along and they collide. The fast one blasts through the slower one, the slower one right as they're arriving at Earth. And that's part of what made it an exceptionally powerful event. And uh, uh, Dr. Green and others did a map of uh, just depicting how far south the aurora was seen. In one case, Bombay in southern India, the magnetometers were going off scale. So the black bars are where the aurora is being seen south. Anybody know what our latitude is here? <coughs> Almost 33 degrees north, yeah. So right about there. So the auroras easily would have been visible to people here in the southwest. So it was a pulse, relaxed, more or less went back to normal because usually the aurora, uh, the aurora oval only goes down to about 50 degrees north and south latitude, but uh, and, and can be seen a little bit farther south on the ground, but it got pushed really, really far south. So this was a powerful event. So we talk about the Carrington event. It's you know a big nod to, to this observation because this was the first time that we had solar activity collide with human technology. The number you dialed has been changed, disconnected, or is no longer in service. The telegraph system was only about 20 years old and already it composed about 120,000 miles of copper wire, 200,000 kilometers. It, it just took off and went all over the place. Uh, it has been called the Victorian Internet uh, uh, because when the operators weren't busy relaying messages uh, which they were being paid to do, if it was Slack, they just sit there and chat back and forth. It was the original tweet system. <laughs> they had telegraph stations catch fire. There were reports of operators getting literally knocked out of their chairs by the electric shock and being found unconscious on the floor. Yes. Some of the operators were running the telegraphs with the batteries disconnected. So this is in Boston, between Boston and Portland, Maine. Uh, batteries also disconnected work on the oral current. How do you receive me? Better than with the batteries on. Mother Nature is powering the whole show. Very well, shall we go ahead with business? So this is what's going on, the telegraph system electrically was very, very simple. And the biggest component of it, physically, was copper wire running from, the, running from one station to the other for miles and miles and miles. With big batteries down at the end, grounded, a key switch that you click, a solenoid that would click at the other end in response, and Morse code, dots, dashes, uh, which in a way we're back to now with zeros and ones pulsing inside computers. So first things, what humans had noticed for uh, decades, centuries, the aurora borealis. Anybody know what, that, what the name means? Northern dawn, aurora australis, southern dawn. The same thing goes on down at South, South Pole, but culturally we think aurora borealis because we live in that hemisphere. And basically all that's happening is when electrons trapped in Earth's magnetic field slam into the upper atmosphere. They're out there all the time. They are bouncing back and forth, zipping around magnetic field lines. The spiral all the way out uh, uh, downwind 
uh, down uh, the direction opposite the solar wind upwards to uh, almost a million miles distant. And they'll hit what this is called a mirror point. Basically, they go down, they reflect, and come spiraling back. And most of the time, just before they hit the atmosphere, hit another mirror point, just, so just spiraling back and forth, back and forth. On the sunward side, solar wind compresses Earth's magnetic field, uh, the, uh, the magnetosphere, which is built up by the magnetic field. Downwind side, it gets pulled out in this long, loose tail. And sometimes you'll wind up with those field lines undergoing what is called reconnection. Basically, north and south lines get wrapped up, tighten up together, and bam, you wind up with a magnetic short circuit, uh, which is, involves an immense release of energy. But most of the time what's happening, you get a little bit of aurora uh, around the north and south magnetic poles as some of the electrons come slamming in. This is Mother Nature's TV picture tube. It's basically what it is. Old style, yeah, we're, we're old enough to remember the old CRT type TV picture tubes. Basically, those were real sophisticated light bulbs. Had a filament in the back, get hot enough that electrons would boil off of it, and the glass plate at the other end was positively charged, so the electron would stream in that direction, and then you had magnets that would, would shape and focus that beam so that it would scan back and forth, and you'd get the picture. So the lines are scanning. This is why if you held your, remember when we were kids, we'd hold our hand up in front of the TV and do like this, and get the stroboscopic effect. It was because the lines were just scanning back and forth. This is basically what was happening with Mother Nature, except it's HDTV of what's going on down in the magnetotail. So it's a nice, pretty display. Uh, uh, you, you can find it in uh, all sorts of ancient records. Uh, been well known for centuries. But here's the fun part that goes on. One plus one equals three. It's a little mnemonic I give kids when we uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, magnetism and electricity. Force or motion, magnetic field, electric current. If you have two of them, you produce the third one. So if I have magnetic field across an electric current, I move something. I've got an electric motor. If I move, some, move magnetic field across a conductor, I produce an electric current. That's how motors and generators work. Same thing happens on a grand scale with Earth's magnetosphere and the planet. And if you've got those long copper wires, this shows transmission lines, but with a Victorian telegraph system, it was basically the same thing. You have a space current moving across that, you're going to induce a current in anything conductive down on the ground. In some parts of the planet, you wouldn't think of dirt as being conductive, and normally it isn't. It's an insulator. In fact, what shows there is a low conduct conductivity area is going to make, is going to shunt that ground current into the power transmission lines and the voltage will build up several volts for every kilometer. The longer the wire, the more the voltage builds up. And some parts of the planet are more conductive than others. The northeast and uh, a large section of the uh, northwest part of the North American continent are on volcanic basalt, which is very conductive. So this is not the first time this sort of thing happened. It's just when our technology had advanced to the point that we collided. I mean, it's, it's uh, silly to think that Mother Nature just pulls these, these little rabbits out of her hat uh, every now and then just for our benefit now. No, it's been going on all the time. And for the most part, life on planet Earth just didn't notice it because there, was no, there were no electrical systems uh, to mess with. So these are, uh, the, that curve shows carbon-14 data from cedars in Japan and other places, uh, uh, oak trees elsewhere. Uh, where they found a sudden spike around the year 774, 775, sudden spike in carbon-14. And I'll explain why that's significant in a second. Uh, at the same time, there are other records. Uh, Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, there appeared in the heavens a red crucifix after sunset. Had to have been an aurora. Timing was just right. But you look at the bars down there, and, you know, that, that seems like, you know, more or less a steady slope downwards and then bam, suddenly it rises and takes a long time to tail off. Okay, the deal with carbon-14 is it's made by cosmic rays. And one of the primary sources of cosmic rays is the sun. So the cosmic rays come slamming into the upper atmosphere and they're going to do it mostly around the auroral ovals because cosmic rays are particles, they're electrically charged, Earth's magnetic field will trap them, they'll zip back and forth, 
you have a really strong event, it squeezes the magnetic field again, it slams those particles into the atmosphere, and they produce free neutrons. They slam into nitrogen-14, which is one of the most stable elements around, and now for just an instant, you've bumped up to 15, it's unstable, <coughs> it pops out a proton, and now you've got carbon-14, which has a half-life of about 7,500 years. Means in about seven and a half thousand years, you only have half of what's left. Another seven and a half, one quarter, and so on. So it decays. So it becomes a really neat clock for counting stuff. And we like to assume that the input from Mother Nature is more or less constant, but it's not. So this gave us a nice indicator that there were probably was something on the scale of a Carrington event around the year 774. Okay, does it tie in with the sunspot cycle? Quite possibly quite possibly. So the 11-year sunspot cycle, uh, which was discovered in the, uh, uh, when Schwab was in the, uh, was in the 1700s, when Schwab finally put the pieces together? 1800s, right, the, the, the data were there. And Schwab was doing a plot, because he's actually looking for a, uh, 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 the planet Vulcan, for a planet that might be orbiting uh, closer to the sun than Mercury. So he wanted to plot out sunspots to eliminate false indicators. And suddenly he gets this graph popping up. I mean, the darn thing had been staring at us uh, for two centuries and nobody noticed it. So Galileo, uh, Fabricius, and Shiner discover sunspots around 1608. And when they went back and looked at the records, discovered that 1645, 1715, there was a period with virtually no spots, very few spots, low solar activity. Turns out that 70 year period was actually three complete magnetic cycles. So we like to talk about the 11-year sunspot cycle. That's actually half of a 22-year magnetic cycle because the sun's north and south poles will flip. The whole thing gets so complicated, it's like, like a ball of yarn the cat's been playing with. It collapses, it flips over, and it restarts, called hysteresis. So that was three magnetic cycles. So you might think that you would get Carrington events at peaks. Uh, so Richard Carrington's event 1859 actually would have been on the downslope of this cycle, actually just about at the minimum. So one of the things that we've seen looking with modern instruments and also reconstructing is that powerful events can happen almost any time. In fact, when I was working at the Solar Observatory Sunspot, uh, one of the scientists told me that there were indicators that the super powerful events tended to happen in periods of lower activity with the sun almost as if everything was getting stored up and it just, bam, went off in one big blast instead of a series of smaller ones. Whoops. <coughs> so again, sunspot cycle, this is a graph that uh, uh, my friend Dave Hathaway did. Uh, uh, so the curves are, you know, statistically, they smooth it to make it look nice and even. The jagged lines are what actually went on. And you can see the last three cycles, 22, 23, and we're uh, about to exit uh, cycle 24. Uh, the maxima have been decreasing, and there are predictions that uh, we could be going into a, uh, an extended minimum period. I can give you that answer in about another 40 or 50 years. <laughs> more, more than one career, and Lou, Lou can testify to this, more than one career in solar physics has gone up on the rocks because somebody said, ah, the sun did this, ta-da, here's my prediction for the next sunspot cycle, and it does something completely different. Okay, and here's the key thing. Uh, uh, th this series of images is done in uh, uh, actually a bright purple color called calcium 2K. It's really hot calcium. One uh, electron has been stripped off on it. It's ionized. It's a good measure of magnetic activity. That's what's driving everything in the sun. That nice image at the beginning with that big loop sticking off of it or during the solar eclipse, you see beautiful, delicate tracings of light around the sun. They're beautiful, but they're anything but delicate. Those are immensely powerful magnetic field lines rooted inside the sun. And it's sometimes called the sun's dark energy problem or the dark side of the sun. You cannot see magnetism. You can only see what it does. And in this case, it's electrified gas trapped along the field line. So what's showing there, 2001 was a maximum, and then it slides off to minimum in 2006, and it's going to start up again. So the bright areas indicate really strong magnetic activity. Okay, so with modern instruments, here's some of the fun stuff that we've seen. August 2, 1972, 
a massive solar eruption, popularly known as the Seahorse Flare. This picture was taken by uh, Big Bear Solar Observatory uh, at Big Bear Lake, California. Uh, the top image, again, is done in calcium, and that area is so bright, I believe, uh, if I'm tr interpreting this right, this area is so bright that it's saturating the detector and showing up as black instead of bright, bright, bright. Down here, this is done in H-alpha, deep red color that uh, also helps us monitor solar activity. So that region there, and we got the seahorse. It disrupted a number of satellites. It disrupted uh, uh, radio communications. If it had happened a few months earlier or later, it could have killed the crew of Apollo 16 or Apollo 17. Could have given them a lethal dose of radiation. Uh, and this was the inspiration uh, for the climax of James Mishner's novel, Space. He hypothesized a mission to the far side of the moon and taking place during, uh, not intentionally, but uh, uh, while the mission's going on, there's a supermassive solar flare and because the crew's on the far side of the moon, no contact with them, can't tell them to get off the surface, get at least inside the command module because at least that has a little bit more uh, radiation protection because the lunar module was, you know, from a, uh, a metal alloy standpoint, that thing was almost built out of paper mache. Very, very fragile. Dynamic, great spacecraft, but fragile. So very little radiation protection. So if this had gone off with our people on the moon, they could have received a lethal dose of radiation, at the very least. Uh, uh, quite likely that they would develop uh, uh, any variety of cancers months, years later. Military implications? Yes, Lou. And that was before Hao Shang Lin was coming up to observe. Uh, Hao Sheng Lin is, is a uh, uh, solar astronomer from the University of Hawaii, Maui, uh, and he, he missed his calling. He really should be a rainmaker because every time he came up to Sunspot to observe, it, it's, it's, why is it crowded here? Oh, Hao Sheng was here. <laughs> Military implications. Uh, this is, this is uh, in the last days of the Vietnam War. We had laid thousands of mines in Haiphong Harbor to block the import of military supplies. Uh, to North Vietnam. 4,000 mines went off within seconds of each other because they had magnetic fuses on them. Ship passes over, you send something metallic pass by, it's basically the same thing going through the, uh, 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 the gate, the TSA gate at the airport with a pocket full of chains. <laughs> Sir, please, you know, stand like this, let's check you out, et cetera. Um, the fuses, the sensors read it as a ship passing overhead and they detonated. So the picture on the right is actually from when uh, uh, they were uh, uh, clearing the harbor after the uh, Paris Treaty. Uh, but it gives you an idea of the kind of boom that they go off with. Okay, next big one, not quite a Carrington event, and neither was 1972. Uh, uh, the uh, Hydro-Quebec power outage in March 1989. Uh, the image at left is uh, uh, built up from satellite and other imagery indicating the shape and direction of the electro jet that wrapped around the world. And normally, again, you see the map, typically the aurora is up there. This time it got forced. The aurora would have been just about visible here at Alamo. Up in Albuquerque, other parts farther north you could see it. So normally, again, the auroral oval is roughly around here. This thing was so powerful, you could think of the auroral oval almost as a rubber band caused by Earth's magnetic field. This is where the field lines would come down as vertical. Things are so powerful, it's like putting your hands inside that rubber band and pushing it farther and farther and farther towards the equator. And that lets particles come in directly from space. And in particular, along the, along the edge of the auroral oval, that's basically almost like uh, having copper wires coming down from space. So what happened? People were in the dark. Something like three million Canadians went in the dark. Uh, they had the transformer station go out and that sent them into what is known as a load shedding event. Loads get shifted from one, one station to another to another. They can't handle the load. Uh, they either trip offline or they get burned offline. You can see over there, those are 
part of the plates in a transformer that got warped by the intense magnetic uh, uh, electrical current going through it and the heating because electricity produces heat even in the best conductors. Halloween 2003, we had a massive event. Some people think that it was almost a Carrington type event, but most of it missed Earth. Uh, satellite, uh, uh, Air Force weather satellite image of the aurora over northern Europe. And uh, the areas down there are not black, where, where you don't see any lights, are not blacked out. If you look closely, there's a light blue cover to it. That's just cloud cover. So you see western Germany and uh, northeastern England uh, were in the clear. They could see what was going on, but elsewhere, uh, they had uh, just clouds blocking the view. Now, this is not a storm, a solar storm event, but it gives you kind of a, uh, uh, an idea of the uh, order of magnitude of what can happen. Uh, this was a uh, uh, weather-related power outage. Storms caused some of the high tension lines to droop. They hit vegetation, trees, tree branches, et cetera, that had not been properly cleared. Someone wasn't doing proper maintenance and it shorted the system out. So he wound up with a cascade, blackouts, Detroit, Cleveland, Columbus, Buffalo, Albany, uh, almost all the way out to the East Coast. You know, most of New York, part of Vermont, parts of Canada, in the dark. The cost, about 100 people died, for various reasons, ranging from uh, some guy falling off a roof when he's trying to break into a blacked out building, uh, to, yeah, that's, that's karma, but the other end of the scale, uh, a young man in his 20s who was recovering from burn injuries. He had skin grafts with the air conditioning out. It couldn't keep the skin grafts cool, and they went septic, and he died from that. Cost, you know, trifling 7 to $10 billion just for that one outage. You, know, you, you have to wonder you know, how much cheaper would it have been just to trim the bushes. <laughs> okay, and here's the near-miss event. Okay, this is Stereo A, I believe. Uh, NASA launched a pair of satellites, uh, Stereo A, Stereo B, solar terrestrial uh, uh, relationships, uh, uh, observatory, I forget, it's a more complex name than that simple acronym. Uh, but the key thing is, among the instruments were coronagraphic telescopes. Uh, basically what you do is you create an artificial eclipse inside the telescope. Uh, it's, uh, it's no easy task to do, but you get phenomenal images. So th this is a composite that depicts the solar disk taken by ultraviolet imagery. So they had to add that in the computer. This is the disk blocking out not just the sun, but the bright inner corona. Because just the bright inner corona itself is only a millionth as bright as, as the face of the sun. And it gets fainter and fainter and fainter as you go out. So you have to have extremely sensitive electronics in order to observe it. What this thing is looking at is super hot gas, plasma, electrified gas coming out of the sun towards the camera and expanding outwards. That's why you've got that particular view. Let me rerun it for you. So, you know, just normal solar wind chuffing away, huffing and puffing. Okay, and all those little white lines, those are high energy particles, mostly high energy protons hitting the detector in the camera and just about frying the electronics. This is another danger with this sort of event. The electronics that we use are so small that the electrical charges, the energy carried by cosmic rays can change memory state. So instead of a zero and a one, maybe it's reading zero, zero, or one, zero, whatever, just flip things around and you have erroneous commands. In some cases, the electronics can be small enough that the damage can be on the same scale as the physical structure of the electronics and burn them out. So a lot of the advanced spacecraft we launch now have redundancy built in. They're inside a vault, which is literally what they call it, a vault, uh, uh, to protect them. Uh, but even then, radiation damage is possible. Uh, so what we saw were a lot of single event 
uh, upsets earlier in the, uh, during the Hydro-Quebec event. This one, though, fortunately, okay, I'll show you in just a second. So here it is just puffing away, and there it goes. That was a Carrington event. Okay, it's about as far away from us as Earth, or about as far away from the sun as Earth. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Stereo A, and Stereo B. So they're basically in roughly the same orbit as the Earth, uh, slightly different, so they're, they're gradually working their way around. But what it does is it lets us get stereoscopic. That's why they, they worked up the name so they could have that acronym. We could get stereoscopic imagery of the sun. So we can make out the 3D structure. We can infer a certain amount with that thing sailing right towards us. And when it seemed to disappear, that doesn't mean it was over there. It was gone. It's just outside the field of view, and it's enveloping you. It's like driving into a fog bank. Yes, sir? Um, yes and no. How's, how's that for a good answer from a state employee? <laughs> Right. All right. The electromagnetic radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, X-ray, and, and sometimes even gamma radiation, that is at speed of light. But the particles are at a fraction of the speed of light. Uh, uh, the maximum speed that I saw mentioned in the literature I reviewed was about 1% of the speed of light, which is pretty darn good. That's better than any rocket we've ever built. Yes. They they have yes they have rec uh, uh, even the Voyagers, which are well beyond uh, uh, Pluto's orbit, uh, have observed the disturbances now much weakened because it spreads out gets weaker and weaker more spread out as it goes out but yes these things have been observed at great distances from the center of the solar system. So again. Earth, the spacecraft that observing uh, in that first video is Stereo A, and watch for the big one that pops up. So we get the, the, these images indicate the, the density and, and the power uh, uh, of the, uh, the CNE, coronal mass ejection is what we call it. And these were discovered in 1971 when uh, a, a technician at uh, a Naval Research Laboratory outside Washington noticed that imagery from the coronagraphic telescope on one of the orbiting solar observatory spacecraft in Earth orbit, uh, which just sort of seemed to brighten up. You know, it was, it was almost like something funny was happening in the data. But there also seemed to be some sort of uh, uh, pattern or structure to it. So we took it to Richard Towsey, who was a pioneer in solar uh, physics in space. Uh, in fact, I, I gave a talk earlier, uh, uh, 1947, he launched the first space-borne solar instrument on a V2 rocket from out here at White Sands. So he has this coronagraph on OSO, and he traces it back and determines that the origin was a bright spot, an active region on the sun. This is the discovery of coronal mass ejections where the sun literally belches a piece of itself weighing several tens of billions of tons with all that uh, atomic bomb equivalent energy wrapped up in it because it's magnetic field. It's got charged particles basically that constrain a plasma ball that's very slowly expanding, and it just sails out across the solar system. And if you're unlucky, you're on the way. And more than one satellite has been hammered and even put out of business by these things. Uh, Japanese spacecraft on its way to Mars had one of its solar arrays heavily damaged by CME. Uh, it happens a lot to communication satellites, but communications operators don't talk about it. Because if you say anything that might indicate that your satellite is vulnerable, well, you're going to have your stuff relayed by someone else who's just as vulnerable and damaged, but he doesn't talk about it. So, you know, you, you never talk about the weaknesses it might have. So, again, Earth is here, and this thing got directed towards stereo A. Let me run that back again. So a certain amount of normal huffing and puffing, coronal mass ejections, mid-level, they can cause problems. And there. If that one had hit us, it could have been lights out for a significant part of the planet. Okay, and this was, looks like here at Earth.
So you see how the magnetosphere gets compressed and squeezed on the sunward side, and the tail is dragged out and squeezed and compressed, and that makes particles come zipping up the field lines, and they're now energized enough that they break through that mirror point that would normally make them reverse. They come down, they hit the atmosphere, produce the aurora. Yes, sir? No. No. Uh, our technology being exposed. Because remember that graph I showed you, carbon 14 through 774, that, you know, human population is modest size, uh, people all over the planet. Uh, that was easily a Carrington scale event, uh, except for recordings of auroras in the Anglo Saxon Chronicles and in Japan and other places. Uh, there was no impact down here none whatsoever. The sun has been doing this sort of thing for four and a half billion years. In fact, there probably were more of them and more powerful uh, uh, in uh, early Earth. But it's not going to affect us down, uh, not going to light anything up here on the surface. It's just with the sense of electronics and the massive power grid we have that we become vulnerable. Yes, sir? Going to get to that in a moment. Everybody scared yet? Good, <laughs> good. <laughs> Everybody's going to go 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 survivalist on us as soon as they leave, right? Okay. So a lot of people have been worrying and talking about it. In particular, Lloyd's of London, insurance agency. Why? Things go bad. They're paying out a lot of money. Their job is to make money, not to pay it, right? You know, you think think about that time. Any time you filed a health care claim, no, you weren't really that sick. We're not going to pay for it. Uh, so they did an assessment on the power grid. Uh, various federal agencies have been doing it as well. And here's the North American power grid. Up there, the Quebec interconnection, the one that, uh, uh, that just collapsed completely, the Hydro-Quebec blackout in 1989. Uh, we're part of the Western interconnection. OK, so that's just a nice little political map. Here's the physical reality. These are the danger zones. This is a computer simulation. And notice that there are two areas, the, the darker the purple, the greater the danger. Two particular areas of vulnerability. One, northern Canada, which fortunately is not that heavily populated, but you know, if you happen to live up there, it's a big deal for you, uh, and Alaska, uh, but also along the eastern seaboard and the Gulf of Mexico. Why? Th th this, this, this really has nothing to do with the population. This is just um, uh, the areas where you could wind up with electromagnetic influence messing things up if they're there. Seawater, highly conductive. Seawater is highly conductive, so that could become a factor. <laughs> it, it, do, it does. <laughs> uh, yes, it does, but uh, the geologic structure and uh, the farther down, because remember, the, the rural oval is more up in this direction. Magnetic north is here. So in terms of geomagnetic pole, California is further away than the eastern seaboard is. So disturbance scenario, uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, the, the American Midwest, New England, all the way down into Georgia. Impacted regions up to 130 million if it had a massive power system collapse. Everything interconnected. It starts collapsing, the loads become greater and greater and greater, things get fried. All of a sudden, it's like a whole bunch of cheap fuses with pennies stuck in the fuse box. And the risk areas can be uneven. It, they can vary by county, uh, depending on the population. And that's basically what they're showing here. The red ones are at greatest risk, uh, yellow, slightly less risk, green, minimal to little risk. But just because you have a lot of green areas that might not get affected doesn't mean it wouldn't be that bad. Because look at the places that would get. Major seaports. How much of what we got, uh, what we get uh, materially comes from overseas, has to come through New York, Baltimore, Hampton Roads, Jacksonville, Florida, et cetera, come in by sea before they put it on a rail and deliver it. Also, just the centers of commerce where things are de determined, where is stuff going to get sent? Who's going to ship it? 
you know, who's gonna, who's gonna, who details the FedEx drivers to pick up this package and send it to that and so, thus and so place. So what are we doing about it? Okay, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has had the Space Weather Prediction Center up in Boulder uh, for I think about 30 years now. And uh, they've actually got legal protection, just like the National Weather Service. They have legal protection. If they make a bad forecast, they're legally protected. They're immune from being sued. That's why you look at what the weatherman on TV says is almost identical to what the weather service says online. If I just repeat what the weather service said, I'm protected too. Okay. Pardon? Yeah, that's exactly. That's where they're getting the data in the first place. Okay, sentinels in space, uh, stereo A and B. I mentioned stereo A is offline, or rather B went offline in 2014. Uh, uh, some of the electronics still, we're not sure exactly what happened there. Stereo A uh, uh, can give us views of the backside of the sun. Uh, SOHO, Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, U.S. European venture, it's been uh, it's 24 years old now. That's long in the tooth for a spacecraft, but it's still working great. Uh, Advanced Composition Explorer, which along with Discover, the, the satellite that uh, Vice President Al Gore got started way back when, which actually has some instruments to replace sensors on uh, ACE, which were disabled, ironically, by a solar storm. So it hangs out here in the solar wind at a gravitational balance point. Uh, but the replacement plans for these are uneven. So NASA's been working on a project called NASA Solar Shield, which is to combine the spacecraft data with information on the ground to provide warnings to the operators. So here's an example of some of the computer modeling they're doing. warning to the operators to disconnect portions of the grid. So you may wind up getting blacked out for a few hours while they ride out the solar storm, but it's better than being blacked out for weeks or months on time, on end. Uh, so how often does this sort of thing happen? Uh, something like the Quebec hydro event. Statistically, we ask, expect it would happen about every 50 years. Uh, the Carrington event, about every 150 years. Now, the one that I just showed you, 2013, or 2012, rather, that was a Carrington event, but it was not directed towards us. So it's, it's kind of a question of, does the sun only do something like this roughly every 150 years, or is it every 150 years? It does it more often, about every 150 years, we're lined up just right, that it would come sailing past us. Okay, so what would it cost? Uh, it could put about 20 to 40 million people or more in the dark. It could take anywhere from two weeks to two years to repair. Because getting a replacement is not like going down to Staples and buying a new UPS for your computer. Uh, th these are big custom built devices. Cost anywhere from 600 billion to two and a half trillion dollars. Warning time, less than half an hour. Which means you have to have a really nimble, adaptive, reactive control system to do this. And beyond that top level information, you think about something like that. If you've got 40 million people in the dark for up to two years, what's going to happen to society? What will happen to the structure of government? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, that's so part of it. You don't want it to be manual. In the Hydro-Quebec event, some of the outages happened in the space of less than two minutes. So they, they need more of the gear to be able to move around and to do the stuff that they need to do to run the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. You've got to realize that the space force will have a, a far greater footprint than the space force to be able to fight this. Yes. You look at pictures of the uh, uh, Trans-Alaska Pipeline from Prude Hove down to Valdez, and about every 100 yards or so, it's like bunny ears sticking up. Those are corrosion blocks basically designed to drain off the excess electrical current. Because as Jim pointed out, that's just a metal wire running about 700 miles from the North Slope down to the Gulf of Alaska. You get a lot of voltage building up on that, and you have to drain it off. So. 
And, and railroads, uh, and, and yeah, any long piece of metal, uh, just the rails themselves could be con uh, would be conductive. All the pipelines we have running cross country carrying natural gas, uh, uh, whatever fuels, those are at risk. So yes, here I am just trying to focus on the power grid itself. But the power grid's not going to work very well if you don't get gas to the state gas station to run your car or natural gas to the house to keep you warm in winter. So. Uh, you're talking about uh, uh, having manual cutouts, et cetera. Uh, uh, yes, if you get enough warning time, you could do that. But two minutes, you know, people, you know, something like this, sometimes it can take you five minutes just to understand what is happening, and that's three minutes after things are burned out. Uh, but part of what they're doing uh, is they're, they're encouraging companies, uh, trying to drive them towards installing equipment that would trip out or equipment that would basically act as shock absorbers to shunt the excess current so that they don't get overloaded or they could simply isolate parts of the grid, uh, reduce the voltage overload and uh, the, uh, their exposure to risk. Uh, so you know, basically that big cylinder is, is one of the, uh, I think I, I believe that one is a massive capacitor system basically designed as a shock absorber. Bottom right, adaptive controls. And if you look real close, you see there at the top right, that's four corners, that's us. Right. Until the day that it happens. Yes, sir. It could arc. If the if the voltage is high enough, it will arc. And and uh, what, how big is the gap between uh, uh, ends of rails? Are we talking about milliamps or are we talking about amps? We're talking about hundreds of amps in some cases. Yes, sir. We're talking talk about a lot of power. Remember, I mentioned just the Victorian telegraph system um, that they found operators knocked out on the floor. The electric arc just on their equipment on the table popped them out of the chair, knocked them unconscious, and that's how they were found by their coworkers. And that was a low power, crude, by comparison, robust system. So you can pay me now or you can pay me later. There's your utility bill. So. This is what we want. We want to keep the lights on. Questions? Um, no. Uh, individual electronics, uh, uh, unless you're in just the right place, are not like, you know, is your cell phone going to catch fire in your pocket? That's more hap likely to happen just from having a bad battery. Uh, because the voltage is going to build up across something that small. Uh, won't be great enough. To make that great, uh, that big of a dis they difference. Could still get to the grid like the refrigerator, uh, if the if, if the grid overpowers, yes, it, it could blow out the circuit panel in, in your house. Can conceivably fry the appliance. It's more likely that the grid simply gets blacked out before that kind of a jolt uh, gets down to the household level. So it doesn't actually fall out the wall. Mm -hmm. I think it did work for them. Um, I'm not sure if it makes that much of a difference because it's, it's not going to be possible to have all. Uh, first off, you won't be able to predict ahead of time exactly which way uh, of the current flow is going to happen coming down from the station. Secondly, it would be impractical to run all the power lines uh, exactly parallel to them. You don't want to have a parallel because if it's running parallel, that's where you get uh, the really strong buildup. Uh, if it was perpendicular, uh, again, it's going to be possible to work out that kind of geometry. I mean, peop people just don't live staggered out that way, except certain parts of the West where the surveyors built cities on grids. Everything else is just sort of higgledy-piggledy at random. Yes, sir? I believe so, but uh, uh, Europe, uh, China, Russia, uh, are also vulnerable. Uh, there's also vulnerabil vulnerability in the southern hemisphere as well. Uh, some of, I'm trying to remember which event it was, uh, it was either Seahorse in 72 or Hydro-Quebec, uh, there were some power outage problems and communication problems in South Africa. Yes, sir. Power 
uh, um, any power line. Yes, and this is, some, this is how Ersted and his students discovered that uh, uh, an electric current will produce a magnetic field, discovered in the early 1800s in the classroom. Uh, but again, the lines run at different angles all over the country. So uh, you're going to get there from one. Yes, sir. Okay, and that, that's what I was mentioning, 1645, 1715, virtually no sunspots. That was the monitor minimum. That was recovered uh, uh, by Jack Eddy, uh, who was a uh, solar physicist at the National Solar Observatory in Tucson. Uh, odd, odd how he found it. He got turned down uh, on a grant proposal, so he was temporarily without funding, uh, but managed, he starts thinking about some of his historical records, gets some support for that. He goes to Paris, Rome, Germany, uh, Zurich, et cetera and starts reconstructing the sunspot records and discovers this period, which actually others had observed uh, before, but uh, a lot of the details were lost and the bigger picture had not been put together. So there was actually a, a, a period before the discovery of sunspots called the Sporer Minimum, which lasted just about as long. Uh, and this is when uh, uh, Sporer Minimum and Maunder Minimum together, Northern Europe was uh, fully embraced by uh, uh, the Little Ice Age. This is the era of Hans Rinker and the Silver Skates, Henry VIII being able to drive uh, a team of three horses across the frozen Thames River and so on. Good, yes. Hi. Uh, again, my favorite all-purpose two-word answer, it depends. Uh, the solar panels, the solar farms themselves, probably not affected that much. It's gonna depend on how long the wires are connecting everybody. So from, from what I have read, the power plants themselves were not affected that much or minimally affected. It's the transformers where you're ramping the power up to uh, uh, kilovolt uh, and even megavolt levels, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of amps going through. Uh, so these, these things are loaded, highly energized, uh, and then you put this extra load on top of them they overheat. They're hot enough in the middle in the first place. That's why you look at them. Uh, it looks like they have all these spin structures on it. That's because to cool it off. If you were to cover that up, the whole thing would short and melt <coughs> in short order. I think a home installation, uh, yes, would be less susceptible. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, the, util the utility company, the utility company put in proper safeguards and protection. Uh, a uh, uh, social scientist, uh, uh, oh geez, I think it's at George Washington University, uh, described this as a uh, low frequency, high consequence event psychologically. It's not likely to happen anytime soon, so you don't worry about it. But when it does, by golly, you wish you'd spent a couple hundred billion a few years ago to fix it so you don't have this $1.6 trillion utility bill. Um, the, yes, as my, uh, the, the Space Weather <laughs> Prediction Center in Boulder. Yes, they are in contact with them routinely. They send out alerts. They will give them heads up. Uh, uh, the CME. Uh, right. Yeah, pe people traveling the, uh, uh, flying over the Arctic Circle are at risk. Uh, I worked with a young lady. <laughs> uh, I worked with a young lady whose dad was a pilot for FedEx. Uh, he, was, he flew New York to Tokyo and back. He lands in Tokyo one day, give him a little card saying there's a solar flare when you're over the North Pole. He'll get in the x-rays for the next six months, not even dental. Yes?
Yeah, the, the, yeah they're, they're working on it, but again, the, the, there's concern that it's, it's not as coordinated as it should be. And again, and that, that aspect of it I didn't delve, uh, dive into deep because I've held you here for almost a full hour, and I'm really only supposed to do it for about 40 minutes, and my overlord is up there wondering <laughs> when I'm going to quit. <laughs> my overlord is up there wondering when I'm going to quit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I quit. Two weeks notice. Well, I, I told you two weeks, so that's just next week. <laughs> oh, jeez, what, what did I put in that email that I sent to you after? Oh. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. and I've got lots of witnesses, and it's on Periscope as well. Um, I'd have to. There's fun stuff, there's going to be hands on activities, yes. Clouds in a bottle, that's Science Saturday. It's going to be about how gas pressure makes clouds and uh, a little bit about the gas laws. So there'll be some fun hands-on stuff. We'll make the kids operate a bicycle pump, burn off a little bit of their energy. So good, re good reason to bring them over.